good morning, everyone from Washington, D.C. This is Jeff Payne from the NISA I believe our 21st iteration of the IOR Maritime Series. I am honored to be joined this morning by Dr. Joshua Tallis, who is at CNA. Um, CNA, if those of you are not familiar, is a kind of hybrid private public um, research and investigative uh, uh, institution that looks at maritime security, uh, naval functions, and a whole host of other issues from counterterrorism to uh, missile issues to everything related to security. Um, Dr. Tallis is experienced looking at the operational components of how to operate in the maritime domain. Uh, he's written a book entitled Muddy Waters, which um, I highly recommend to anyone who has not encountered it yet. And we're here to talk about his views on the, the kind of constraints, opportunities, um, as well as other aspects uh, shaping the maritime domain in the Indian Ocean. Um, so with that introduction, uh, Dr. Tallis, let me uh, start off with how do you see the kind of shape of the Indian Ocean right now in October of 2020? What, what things are you interested in? What things are you concerned about? What are you following? Sure. <clears throat> Jeff, first, thanks for, thanks for having me. And um, I'm excited to, to meet with you and to sort of bring these issues into, into a new forum for me. Um, I think what I'm looking at yeah, in the Indian Ocean, and I should sort of, I guess, back up a little bit just to, to give some context for, for, for listeners and, and viewers that um, I approach, in particular, the maritime security issue more as a functionalist than a regionalist. So I've got a smattering of expertise across various subregions, and um, you know, you, you kindly plug the book, and, and if folks pick it up, you know, you'll note that there are some sections that speak specifically to Southeast Asia, in particular, the Straits of Malacca and, and Singapore. Um, but speaking more from sort of a strategy and policy perspective, what I'm looking at in the Indian, in, in the Indian Ocean region is similar to the issue that I'm curious about globally for the U.S. and for the U.S. Navy, which is how do you strike in the maritime sphere an effective balance between great power competition and strategic competition with near peer and peer adversaries like China and Russia versus the rest? Right. The the this is sort of a classic issue um, that seems to have been written out of a lot of the storyline at the strategic level in terms of the implications of, of the national defense strategy for for planning and strategic thinking. But if folks go back and review the unclassified summary, you'll notice that while there is an obvious heavy focus on Russia and China, the national defense strategy doesn't ignore entirely the, the presence of smaller smaller threats, both from, from smaller states like Iran and North Korea, as well as from non-state actors. You know, the NDS mentioned specifically ISIS and terrorism, um, but it's just obvious from what the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps is asked to do in practice that these smaller scale issues remain a significant portion of their strategic responsibility. So I'm interested overall in this balance of focusing on strategic competition is clearly the most important thing that the armed forces have to reckon with. Uh, in, in, you know, in, in this current era, while at the same time finding ways to effectively and cost effectively address that smattering of smaller scale issues. That's great, because that, that gets kind of to the heart of the series, which is about the larger geopolitical and geostrategic uh, issues going on. But in the specificity of, of the factors and forces that are shaping the Indian Ocean littoral, um, and one of those big issues that um, is below the kind of geostrategic is the bizarre um, hybrid kind of nature of various illicit groups and how they operate. I mean, you could target the Red Sea and the Arabian Sea area, you could look at Southeast Asia. This mixture of violent extremists tied in with human traffickers, tied in with narco traffickers, and they're not necessarily a, like partnered, they're just aligned in how they, they, they go beyond the bounds of, of, of legal processes to engage in their illegal activities. So getting into that, like, what is the nature of that kind of hybrid threat? Because a lot of people tend to focus on one aspect of it. And one of the things I liked about your book is you kind of dive into all of it all together, that it's about the method, not the necessarily the actor who is engaged. So can you can you give me more about how you see that issue? 
Sure. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate the question. And and for folks who you know who like like you have read the book, you know, you'll probably you'll you'll get cross-eyed with the word multidimensional. It comes up so many times. But for me, that is a really big somewhat obvious finding but how do you operationalize that becomes really problematic right the, U the us and you know you and i are uh, you know as we were talking about before before we hit record we're, you know we're talking both you know as americans working at american institutions that support dod so we're going to speak objectively from that standpoint you know the us has at its disposal a phenomenal bureaucracy but at the same time in order for the bureaucracy to organize itself it tends a tendency to break down into fairly discrete silos, right? So you've got elements of an organization that work on narcotics issues, firearms trafficking, human trafficking. And then even when you've got more of a cross-cutting organization in theory like the US Navy or, or the US Marine Corps or the US Coast Guard for that matter, they are often still conducting operations that are specifically siloed to address an individual threat. So you are working on counter narcotics or counter terrorism or countering human trafficking, counter terror financing, whatever the case may be. Often that's a legal function that, that the remit for that particular mission is drawn in a very narrow setting uh, for reasons outside of the individual operator's control. But it can lead to some really bizarre circumstances where a Coast Guard cutter that intercepts a vessel that is suspected of narcotics trafficking, but you know, may have indications that they're engaged in another form of illicit activity, may not necessarily have the operational uh, authority to, to do something about it in that moment. Um, so I spend a lot of time uh, in my book and in my, my, my dissertation research focusing on the larger context of the enforcement environment, where what should matter less is the individual threat that you're targeting and more focusing on the overarching context within which those activities take place. Um, so I'm, I'm writing a, a book chapter right now on uh, maritime terrorism for a, a forthcoming Rutledge handbook on maritime security, which folks who are interested in this may may be interested in in, uh, in picking up a copy of sometime next year uh, when that comes out. But one of the sections of the the draft chapter that I was working on has was this sort of endemic question of the crime terror ne nexus, uh, which which some folks may be familiar with, and one of the the challenging discussions to have with folks who are less expert in this field is to parse the nuance that in many cases, there's no direct relationship between transnational criminal organizations and terrorist organizations, right? There's, there are, it's not to say it never happens, but the direct tendrils between, you know, an organization active in narcotics trafficking and an organization that's explicitly oriented around violent extremism is not particularly common. At the same time, the underlying circumstances that make it feasible for those operate for those organizations to take advantage of the maritime space are very familiar. So, if if you know if you're familiar with, for example, Martin Murphy's work, uh, uh, you know, on on, uh, on piracy and maritime terrorism, you know, the 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 seven or eight conditions that that he identifies as baseline prerequisites for what might lead to higher rates of piracy. Uh, in a certain part of the world. And this is true across the Indian Ocean littoral region. Those conditions are fairly similar to the same types of circumstances that may lead to the rise of maritime terrorism. It, 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 so, you know, it's my argument throughout my, my book and my research, which sort of overlaps with, with similar arguments from a lot of scholars in maritime security world, uh, is that focusing on the context that creates instability in the maritime space is more effective because it will address that wide berth of interlocking maritime issues. While at the same time, if you try to simply go after one individual issue at a time, you just leave real gaps in terms of either the organizations that you're targeting or your ability to disrupt the totality of one organization's operations. That's great because that's a natural segue into my next question. I agree with you. I'm one of those those people looking at the maritime domain and, and understand that it's the base base conditions, not the actual activity that will, um, if we treat those base conditions, that's how we eradicate the, the kind of larger problem. But in the Indian Ocean littoral, uh, there are substantial areas where there are there is a breakdown of law and order that there's not a functional state. So the issue of Yemen, for instance, the Yemen conflict, um, the Horn of Africa region, uh, specifically Somalia, with the internal divisions that 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 continue to plague that, that country. 
Um, but beyond that, if you just go beyond kind of the lawless areas, there's also the issue that these criminal actors, whether they be violent extremists or smugglers or whatever they are, are very effective at, at traversing territorial waters and knowing exactly how to navigate in and out of, of kind of the, the, the global commons and then territorial realms. They can't get too far from land because that's where they make their money. Um, but how does a state, say a developing state in the Indian Ocean, um, that does not have the depth um, and all of the toys that more developed maritime actors have, how do they address some of these challenges without, you know, um, the standard, we need more ships, we need more this, we need more that. Um, how do you how do you become more clever with a, a limited uh, you know capa capability? Sure, that's so that's that's a great question and kind of gets at the heart of what I was really interested in, particularly for my for my dissertation research, which is so you know you've got a large alumni network. I'm sure many folks are are probably uh, you know either U.S. Navy uh, affiliated or at least sort of familiar with the typical way that the Navy react to, to these types of questions, which is what hardware do we need to fix this problem? Which is a reasonable and logical question for a service that is fundamentally reliant on what you're standing on, right? Um, at the same time, and this is reflected actually in uh, former CNO Richardson's uh, design for, for maintaining uh, maritime superiority. Uh, if you take a look at that document, there's a, a spectrum of conflict and the spectrum is broken down, uh, loosely speaking, in sort of a high end and a low end section. And uh, so, you know, Richards identified the high end as mainly a, a, uh, a capability issue. Are we buying the right stuff? And, and is the Navy trained to operate that stuff effectively? And at the low end, he identified that mostly as a conceptual issue. Uh, which is to say that by and large, the Navy probably has what it needs to address lower end hybrid Titan maritime security threats. The question then becomes, how do you leverage them to your point effectively and creatively in order to address those problems? You know, I'll throw out sort of one brief uh, sort of uh, uh, objection to that, which is to say, you know, there's an old line, which I think is attributed uh, uh, to Eisenhower, which is if you can win a, a big war, you can win a small one. And so sort of my whole thesis is that that's, that's probably not true, right? That, that, you know, not only do the operational concepts that come with stuff translate poorly uh, into addressing smaller scale issues, but I think there's a fairly uh, credible argument to be made um, that you also probably need to buy some niche capabilities in order to address smaller issues. I'll set that aside because ultimately you can do quite a lot with the capabilities that the Navy already has. And so, you know, the, the investment decision in terms of, you know, whether or not you want to buy you know, specific capabilities um, is more of sort of a, in the world of uh, if I had my dreams and not sort of the world of reality. From a capacity standpoint, which is more in line with, with the question that you're asking, that's in particular really important when we're thinking about allies and partners. Um, because, you know, to your point, allies and partners will always want more material from us. That's a perfectly reasonable request. But at the same time, there is simply a cap on the amount of material that the U.S. is going to be able to supply to every ally and partner in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, you know, and at the same time, there's there's generally a cap on, on uh, some uh, allied and partner capability to operate more sophisticated material, right? So at some point, it's not a question of whether they have enough stuff. It's a question of, of whether or not they're using it effectively. I've argued, and, and actually, I think some of the, the wording in your question speaks to this itself. I've argued that particularly from a, a maritime security standpoint, we, the United States, need to be encouraging particularly lower capacity allies and partners to focus much more explicitly on a constabulary function in, in their near waters, in their territorial seas, and in you know, the, the closer inshore exclusive economic zones. You, know, you mentioned things like uh, law and order. Um, you know, and, and I think that really speaks to the key operational challenge. Like the US Navy is exceptionally good at blowing holes in the water. Um, and sometimes that's an important capability. But if you are Sri Lanka uh, and you're mostly concerned about narcotics trafficking, or if you're Indonesia and you're mostly concerned about illegal fishing, or if you're Malaysia and you're mostly concerned about human trafficking, or if you're Singapore and you're mostly concerned about piracy, 
putting holes in the water is not necessarily the most efficacious or even you know legal course of action. Right? You are fundamentally addressing issues that are more criminal in nature than they are uh, you know closer closer to issues of war. They may have implications over the long term in terms of regional stability and a country's ability to create situational awareness in the maritime space could pay dividends for the United States in terms of its its uh, interest in higher end threats in the region. But fundamentally, it's about whether or not you're policing that space effectively. And, and you know, as, as viewers who are, you know, in the United States or have been paying attention to American media over the last four or five months are familiar with, there's a lively debate about different ways of policing spaces. Um, and those debates have relevance in the maritime space as well. So I, I've been going on for a little while, so I'll, I, can, I can pause there. But my, my, my sort of bumper sticker to your question is, there's a lot that both the United States and allies and partners can manipulate in terms of the way that they're operating, even if we assume that the baseline capabilities of, the, of those forces won't change significantly. Well, that's great. Um, to the issue of, of, of conceptualizing like what it means to be a constabulary force. Uh, I think that there is a, as, as someone who also works in the maritime domain and everyone who watching this who works in maritime issues, it's all too common for maritime forces, whether they be guards, uh, navies, uh, coastal defense forces, whatever they are, national police, maritime police forces, they're always at the bottom rung of kind of the um, priority ladder in, in security and defense and and, uh, and and homeland security kind of conversations. Um, but that doesn't change the nature of the complexity of what we're dealing with. And so another kind of thing that I've noticed, um, at least in the Indian Ocean region, is there is a lot of conversation on um, at the kind of higher analytical strategic uh, uh, stage on need for cooperation and engagement and so on and so forth. When you actually get down to the operational, um, multilateral connectivity among forces who are doing this policing function is, is not as common. That There's still the go it alone kind of mentality that, you know, if you are Madagascar, when you hit, um, you know, get near Comoros waters, then, you know, your responsibility or, 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 or you know, neighborly responsibility to Comoros for, a, 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 you know, a tracking uh, traffickers or whatever it is, um, disappears. And so how do we, um, the issue becomes, how do we build cooperation? Because the example I always use in conversations is that if you look back to the, the, the 1980s, especially the early 1980s, the Caribbean corridor for drug trafficking was essentially open all the way until you got to the Gulf Coast of, of the United States, specifically Southern Florida, um, for narco traffickers to, to, to ship pretty much anything they wanted. Um, the U.S. heightened port security. The U.S. Uh, you know did more with its own territorial area, got a little bit better, but they still weren't stopping the flow. It was only once Caribbean partners and a whole kind of dragnet of monitoring systems made that route so costly that narco traffickers had to develop other specifically overland routes through Mexico. Um, now that brings up its own problem set, but it's an example of how maritime cooperative action solved a one of these lower end uh, problems in the kind of Navy's kind of rating of, of what it does. So taking that logic to the Indian Ocean, what what is a starting point for you? And this is this is purely speculative on your on your part. But what is a starting point for you for having this kind of real cooperative action kind of build steam on the operational level? Sure. I mean, so I guess the where I'll start with that is to say, and this shouldn't be surprising, I think, for most folks, that the maritime domain offers and this. So I've got a paper uh, with CNA that I put out maybe three or four months ago. Um, which, which I can send to you, that speaks to the relationship specifically between maritime security and strategic competition. I want to link that really small end stuff straight up to the most strategic questions that are facing uh, DOD uh, and, and the fleet today. Um, and one of the, the fairly straightforward conclusions is that the, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, the maritime services, by dint of operating in the maritime space, are uniquely positioned to aid in, in certain types of 
uh, system maintenance, right? And thinking about the international order, which is fundamentally built on the flow of goods, material, and commerce over the maritime space, right? So the 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 sea services are, are uniquely positioned to help sustain the international order. And the maritime space, sort of nesting underneath that. Uh, is a uniquely valuable domain for fostering cooperation. So, you know, very much to your, to your point, um, non-state actors will invariably try and leverage sort of an enforcement arbitrage, right? I mean, we see this in the Caribbean quite frequently where the, 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 uh, the maritime boundaries are much uh, closer together. Uh, but we see this in, you know, in, in archipelagic locations in Southeast Asia as well, where, you know, you may stage an attack in, in either the high seas or in one country's territorial waters, and then you know, you know, press the, the pedal to the metal and, and try and hightail it to another country's territorial waters to try and confuse hot pursuit and, and, and things of that nature. There are already great examples of uh, countries learning to cooperate in the maritime space, which I think is probably a function of the fact that it's just a less sensitive boundary as compared to something like hot pursuit over land, right? You're, you're, a country is very unlikely to let another country's army or even its police forces chase a hot, you know, a, a hostile force uh, over a land border. Um, but already we've got great examples of countries cooperating in, in the maritime space uh, to jump out of the Indian Ocean region uh, to the other coast of Africa, the Yunde Code of Conduct offers a really good example about how countries can can sort of burden share in terms of their uh, uh, maritime surveillance capabilities uh, and and to try and build these information sharing and information fusion networks that can cut across uh, you know these somewhat artificial uh, maritime boundaries. Um, so that's my my overarching sort of uh, backdrop to your to your question is that that the maritime space is probably the most unique operational domain in order for for the US to foster greater cooperation among regional allies and partners themselves as well as between those regional allies and the United States and that from just the standpoint of interoperability capacity building is important for both regional security but in theory if some of these partners get to a more robust status where they're really capable of monitoring activities in their own EEZs um, that has has clear benefits in terms of the larger strategic uh, picture the other element that I'll I'd add to that uh, is you know this question of how do you get buy-in um, you know, I think your example of the Caribbean is instructive, in part because my understanding of the history of counter-narcotics in that region was that one of, one of the challenges the United States had getting buy-in from Caribbean nations in, in, in uh, the, the 70s uh, in particular was that it just wasn't an issue for most of those countries, right? Narcotic traffickers were going through the Caribbean, but they weren't really stopping in the Caribbean. They weren't creating uh, local challenges. And that one of the ways that ultimately resulted in the U.S. getting buy-in from Caribbean nations to participate in counter-narcotics operations and become valuable partners was because narcotics trafficking ended up taking root in those individual countries. And narcotic and traffickers were, were paying in kind for services. So you had the rise in, in drug use in these individual countries where there hadn't been significant cocaine use previously. So all of a sudden these became local problems. So what I'm getting at there is, and this is something I talk about a, a lot in, in, in my book, which is you, the United States, as the major sponsor and partner, have a lot of leverage simply by being the United States and footing the bill for a lot of these operations and, and serving as the major coordinating entity. But if you want long-term effective buy-in from allies and partners, it's important to figure out what their hook is and what their priorities are. And it's very possible that their priorities are not in the immediate term equal to that of the United States. And this gets back to where we started this conversation, which is to say, if the United States wants to build, in fact, we read this problem uh, post 9-11 in, in Southeast Asia, right? The United States is predominantly worried at that time about, about terrorism, encountering terrorism and maritime terrorism uh, near the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. But as I mentioned, right, you've got these, these host of countries who may be concerned about terrorism, but it's not their first priority issue, particularly in the maritime space. And that can be frustrating, uh, you know, for the United States to face an issue where Indonesia is more interested in illegal fishing than they are in helping the U.S. when it comes to maritime terrorism. But as, as we started, you know, our, our, our conversation, if you understand the baseline issue simply to be 
the overarching context of insecurity in the maritime domain, then the fact that Indonesia is interested in curbing illegal fishing is itself the hook that you need in order to get them bought into your larger project of, of cooperation. So, so there's the element of recognizing the maritime space as unique in terms of facilitating cooperation among uh, allies and partners because it's a less threatening operating environment as compared to on land uh, or directly overhead a, a, a country's territory. And simultaneously, there needs to be flexibility and creativity on the part of the United States to recognize that it is more important to generate buy-in to the larger project of generating generating security than it is whether or not an individual partner is specifically interested in the same security issue as you are. Well put. Um, and, and a good way of approaching it, I think, uh, exactly right, talking about this hook. Um, we do get bogged down in the specific terminology of what they're interested in and not how it impacts the domain that, that we're all effectively operating in. Um, this is a, a question that kind of switches gears. Uh, it's also something that we're struggling with at NISA and a lot of our institutions that we partner with throughout the Indian Ocean are struggling with. And that is, um, it, it is quite frankly, uh, how you see that the, what should be the role of the United States when it comes to, to MARSEC kind of comprehensively. Um, you know, on the one hand, if you look at the Indian Ocean, there is an alphabet soup of organizations, whether they be civilian-led, UN-led, government-led, uh, multilateral, um, that are engaged in specific components related to the maritime domain. And there's one hand of thinking that says the United States cannot lead anything, but should be a partner with everyone who is willing to partner with the U.S. There's another style of thinking that says the U.S. has gone some type of leadership role. But it's an open question of what that leadership role should look like. If it should be direction, which I personally have problems with, and more as because of just the sheer size and scope and experience in the U.S. and the maritime domain as a director of information, more like a conduit for data, um, in, a, in a way like a, a nation state serving kind of as an information fusion center, so to speak, for the entirety of the Indian Ocean. Um, what are your thoughts there? Because uh, um, I, I, there's definitely great logic for both kind of ways of thinking. Where do you fall? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. It's one that I'm sort of uh, um, trying to perpetually reassess whether or not, um, you know, I think my, my priors are, are holding up. I think we're all, uh, maybe I shouldn't say all, I think there's a, there's a large movement of folks who are sort of uh, increasingly coming out of this post 9-11 era um, deeply skeptical about the United States' ability to be, um, you know, global global police. I think is is a little bit of, of a sort of a snide way of referring to it. Um, but you know, I mean, the, the United States is is active in, in counterterrorism operations. I think I saw a statistic the other day in like four percent of the world's landmass. I mean, just the, the the global scale of of kinetic or kinetic adjacent operations um, is massive. Uh, and, and strikes me as as likely unsustainable. Where I get concerned, uh, not to sort of wax too far out of my area of specialty, what I get concerned is is not necessarily the specifics of whether or not the U.S. is trying to uh, to do too much as sort of world police, but the concern about a knee jerk reaction in the other direction, where as larger scale issues grow in significance. What we end up having is that the United States cuts the cord on all of its maritime security operations. Um, that to me is, is sort of the overreaction I'm worried about at the other extreme, right? On the one hand, we're sort of we're recognizing that that you know America as, as world police is probably not an effective way of going about business, but the United States, as absent on the global stage, is also probably equally, if if not more so, problematic. Uh, the way I've been thinking about that question lately is to break the strategic question into, into two halves, right? So if you think about what does victory look like in great power competition, right? It's, 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 it's to some extent, it's, it's a, it's a, an unbounded competition and it's, it's potentially infinite. And so the question is victory look like can seem a little silly, but I think it's valuable to consider what end state you're looking for. And in, in theory, competitions have, have objectives. So what's our, what's our ultimate objective in, in great power competition? 
to my mind, the ultimate objective is for the United States to maintain its position of influence over the, the international system, okay? So, okay, if we understand victory, uh, the victory condition power competition to be uh, U.S. maintained leadership over the international order, that begs the question of what could adversaries do to threaten that status? And to me, that question has two answers. There is the capacity for uh, uh, an acute overthrow, overthrow of the international system, um, which is an a, a unnecessarily fancy way of basically saying great power war, right? The, the only, the only uh, actors in the international system who could immediately overthrow the U.S. position at the top of the international system are rival great powers. And the only way that they could do so in an immediate fashion is a great power war. And that's the sort of that the armed forces and the Navy in particular spend most of their time preparing for and thinking about is how you deter and if need be win a war with a rival great power. Okay, important conversation, but we can set that to one side. The other question that I think about with respect to how the United States could lose its position at the top of the international system is a long-term erosion and degradation of the international system and the value that brings to allies and partners who ultimately agree to participate in that system willingly because it brings them economic advantages and adhering to the US security umbrella brings them security advantages. But if the economic or the security advantages erode over time, it is possible that you basically have death by a thousand cuts. And that's the concern that I think maritime security plays right into, which is to say it's, it is a strategic issue that the, that the Navy and the US uh, has to think about how to avoid a death by a thousand cuts and a position where 35 years from now, the international system is just less functional or less valuable. And as a consequence, the United States position atop it is less useful. That's a really long-winded walk to, to back to your, your original question, which is to say, I see the United States as critical to not just defending the system from acute overthrow and an effort by, for example, China or Russia to fundamentally revive the international system tomorrow. But also I see the US and in particular the Navy, the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard as fundamental to the day-to-day -day maintenance of the system to avoid that longitudinal erosion or the act of corrosion on the part of great powers or lesser powers, right? I mean, death by a thousand cuts can come from any, from much smaller actors or a combination of actors. So that doesn't directly answer the question of how active should the U.S. be, you know, in terms of being the, the organization that, that's doing all of the, the activities versus the actor that's coordinating the activities. To some extent, I think I'm agnostic on, on how it gets done, and I'm much more interested in making sure that the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, leaders in DOD, policymakers, uh, officers and others who are responsible for, for implementing uh, these activities understand the mission of maritime security to be a strategic mission uh, and that hunting pirates or uh, enforcing sanctions are fundamentally play into this larger objective of sustaining the maritime system, which undergirds the international order. So I apologize, I, I went a little, uh, a little uh, perhaps over academic on you there. That, that's useful. I mean, it, it's getting to what I, I'm, I'm struggling with too. Um, the, uh, the the follow-up question then is this, um, and it, it's a it's on it's on one hand it's simpler question, but it also is far more <laughs> problematic, especially from American points of view. And that is that um, the post Cold War era uh, of being the sole superpower, um, and honestly the the global war on terror following 9/11, kind of especially in the Department of Defense, ingrain this perspective that the good work done by the United States should remain below radar because there was inevitably a backlash to the pomp and circumstance of kind of celebrating, uh, you know, effective conclusions or effective results of partnerships, alliances, and so on and so forth. But in this new age, especially, and I don't know, I'm, I'm projecting this onto you, but given that I think we have similar viewpoints on this, but I, one of the things that I think the U.S. should be doing is, is hitting every drum, banging every gong about the good work that is being done, especially if it is not being done with the United States as an active actor in it, that, that countries in and of themselves um, are pursuing the kind of work that the U.S. wants to see as part of the international system. And that there seems to be a knee-jerk reaction on the part of, of the DOD, especially to 
keep quiet because we, do, we don't want to risk a backlash. So first off, do you agree with that? And secondly, what sort of pomp and circumstance should we be looking for to kind of sell the good work that we're after? Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I think that that your diagnosis is probably right. Um, and that <clears throat> for, I think for, for some good reason, um, f policymakers are wary of the idea of sort of the U.S. as, as being sort of 50,000 feet tall, just sort of, uh, you know, trundling through uh, smaller countries and, and the perception, including some of the local perceptions and some of the challenges it can create for, 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 for host governments if they're seen as either being too in bed with the United States or, you know, something that, that we don't necessarily think a whole lot about. But if you think about um, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, or a goodwill cruise on the part of the comfort or mercy, the hospital ships. Um, you know, they, they, they can bring a lot of goodwill in the countries they're operating. It is also theoretically possible that they end up underscoring to local populations how inept their own regional governance may be in terms of providing similar services. And so I think there's a reason to be at least aware of the potential for good natured efforts on the part of the U.S. to provide assistance uh, to, to, to smaller countries to backfire if we are too cavalier or, uh, you know, stand aside, you know, Uncle Sam is here to help. But I think your larger point is very much correct, which is, you know, it's, it's probably almost a cliche at this point to, 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 to phrase it this way. But great power competition is probably most fundamentally a battle over friends. Right. I mean, that, that's basically another way of, of saying, how does the U.S. maintain its position at the top of the international order? Well, the international order is is ultimately just a collection of other countries. And if you want to maintain your position as a leader among those countries, uh, then you need and want those countries to to need and want to affiliate and associate with with the United States. Right. So I think that that really speaks to your underlying question, which is. What does the U.S. need to do or perhaps think differently about in order to wage an effective influence campaign uh, to remain the partner of choice with allies and partners um, who have very diverse requirements, very diverse security challenges, um, very diverse operating and, and, and political environments? Um, for me, it really goes back to uh, a one size fits all model is, is and will never be effective. Um, for for securing uh, partnership and, and cooperation, and that partnership, it can be perhaps derisive to say that partnership and cooperation should be an objective in its own right. And I think uh, a lot of folks might say, but but why? You know, why would you want to operate in in a certain country without any other objective other than forging a partnership? And it's because a lot of, especially in the maritime space, a lot of the capabilities that are generated by that goodwill and that partnership and training and cooperation, even if uh, you know, a, a nation is interested in them for developing counter-narcotics capabilities. They're fundamentally transferable, right? I mean, a lot of the, you know, cap platforms in, in, in the maritime space are, are inherently multi-mission. Um, and, and the capabilities, in particular maritime domain awareness, um, can be leveraged to, to be aware of anything in that domain, right? And so finding the buy-in and, and the interests of a partner and just running with it, I think, is probably the most, the most critical issue that, that, the, that the U.S. Think can do right in terms of, of forging that cooperation, that partnership, and focusing on the building of, of that cooperation and that partnership, in some sense, for its own sake, because it has derivative values that, that the U.S. is looking for, even though we're not messaging it in that direction. And I think that's also somewhat the answer to the question you posed, which is to say, if we, the United States, can be more comfortable messaging or acknowledging the specific local interests of host nations and allies and partners, then it is feasible for the United States to be much more open and public about the ways that it is attempting to support those host nations and, and their equities, because they will be, in theory at least, directly in line with the political messages that allies and partners want to be sending in their home countries. If we insist that everything we're doing is about countering China, um, whereas a country like Djibouti, uh, it, you know, is, is more interested in fundamental capacity building, um, that can be really problematic. In, in part because, you know, this is this is not a secret. Those countries will continue to take money and help from the U.S. and China. What matters for us is that we maintain our status as the partner of choice, and that if push comes to shove, we have the capacity to assure access or help and facilitation from those allies and partners 
over China, right? So it's this question of, of being being delicate, but not being silent, which I think is kind of, of, of what you're asking about. And to me, the answer just fundamentally comes back to find out what your partners want and need, speak to that and trust that in doing so, you are also achieving your own silent objectives. I agree. I mean, it, part of it is getting our own kind of team um, on, on the right path. Uh, a senior leader engagement, for instance, that's going to deal with this, the grand strategic and the geopolitical. You know, if the foreign ministers of the Quad sit down, yeah, it's going to be a lot of conversation about uh, China, great power competition, established rules and norms, etc. Um, but embassies themselves, um, it can they can lead on this forefront. And then there are certain institutions inside the DoD or affiliated with it, like CNA like NISA um, that can approach it. Because one, the reason I bring up this question is that um, I have a lot of conversations throughout uh, with our Middle East partners about maritime domain awareness and the importance of the maritime domain. Um, and it's an uphill battle to, to some extent just because of the way the militaries are shaped in, the, in a lot of those states, especially in the Gulf Arab kingdoms. Um, but also when I'm having these conversations is the inevitable you know, behind the scenes, a chant of the United States is departing the Middle East, the United States is disengaging from the Middle East. And that's just, you know, yes, from the height of what happened in the invasion of Iraq, yes, the United States has definitely made a uh, withdrawn from the region, but its interests are still there. Its its presence is still ever present. Um, its diplomatic energies are still there as proof with the fostering of the Israeli UAE deal, the United States was keenly engaged and encouraging of that. Um, the Fifth Fleet is still active and going to maintain, you know, freedom of navigation and overall maritime security um, in the Strait of Hormuz and Baba Mendeb and every, everything in between. But I agree with you in that it has to be directed towards specific interests. It can't be dictated from the United States to, say, Djibouti, that you have to be on our side vis-a-vis -vis great power competition. More along the lines, U.S. is partnering with Djibouti to maintain uh, counter-narcotics uh, interdiction and other constabulary functions in the Red Sea uh, in support of, of Djibouti's security as well as regional security. I mean, honestly, my kind of uh, talking point that I always say is that Maritime security and having a conversation about Indian Ocean and, the, and the, the sustainability and prosperity of it, as well as the security, is the way to win great power competition. Um, you beat China by not really talking about China, so to speak. Um, and, and that's, I mean, the, the military side will de definitely do its planning and its machinations related to, you know, an actual direct conflict. But a lot of the diplomatic and administrative and strategic kind of effort um, needs to be done in a different mentality. So that's the background of my question and kind of where my thought process is. So no, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, and, and I think thinking about lower level maritime security issues um, as an issue that basically every country is interested in, but one that just takes the political temperature down as compared to talking about great power competition um, is a very sort of feasible way of building those relationships while not talk, like you said, not, not talking about the elephant in the room, but basically still getting the operational enhancement that the United States is looking for, potentially the, the access and, and the, the basing facilitation that, that the U.S. is looking for. You know, your, your comment made me think of, of uh, sort of two issues that I, I hope somebody out there is, is looking into. Um, the first relates to the question of, uh, you know, how do you strike this balance effectively, right, where we, where we started the conversation um, and how, you know, like to your point, Fifth Fleet isn't going anywhere, but Fifth Fleet's relative significance as compared to other parts of the Indo-Pacific theater and to that extent, other parts of, of, of UCOM as well is, is in relative decline. And the answer on one hand could be that, that Fifth Fleet uh, or CENTCOM will just continue to fight tooth and nail uh, for as many resources as it can, as it can, you know, possibly get its hands on. But at some point, I am concerned that that risks simply breaking. Uh, and Fifth Fleet goes from having, you know, 1.0 carrier presence to, you know, what you've cried wolf. We, you know, there are rising threats in other theaters. You know, your your requirement is, is simply being cut. Versus CENTCOM and and Fifth Fleet taking a really you know critical and and somewhat painful reexamination of 
how do its missions fit into the larger strategic context now? And what, what is really necessary in order to accomplish those? I think maritime security type considerations are an effective way of, of making that argument while at the same time re-baselining uh, the, the presence requirements in the theater to recognize the rising prom, uh, prominence of, of other issues. The second point that relates to that, and this is uh, to, to paraphrase uh, an old professor of mine, Richard English, uh, who, uh, who in this line really stuck with me, which is to say, uh, acts of terrorism uh, shape the world far less than state reactions to acts of terrorism. Uh, which is to say uh, that my concern with with uh, an inability to think critically and strategically about the role of maritime security missions uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, but in, in particular in, in the Indian, Indian Ocean region uh, and in the, the Fifth Fleet area of operations, is that without a real blueprint or plan for how smaller scale threats fit into the larger American strategic narrative, Inevitably, something will happen, a crisis will get triggered, and the United States will likely over-respond and over-commit resources, which will create an, an unsustainable dynamic. And we kind of saw this you know, several months ago uh, with, with the, uh, the, the, the war scare uh, with Iran, which resulted in going from a basically zero carrier presence uh, in the region to, once again, a 1.0 carrier presence in the region. Uh, and it is imperative to understand the role of small scale threats in the American security uh, complex to avoid these knee jerk swings from we don't care about Fifth Fleet at all to Fifth Fleet is now the most important AOR in the American strategic context back to we don't care about Fifth Fleet at all. You know, to avoid that pendulum swing, uh, we need to think much more creatively and strategically about the role that maritime security plays in, in American policy. Josh, uh, we'll have many conversations following up on, on a whole sorts of other things related to that. Um, but uh, we're going to cut it off here. Um, I kept you for long enough. Um, but for everyone who watches, thank you so much for your attention. Um, you can obviously reach out to Nisa anytime you want for any questions, um, and we can connect you with Dr. Talos, I'm sure, uh, for any follow-up to him. But, uh, Josh, thank you so much, um, and uh, you have a good remainder of your day. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me.